Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete our very first RimWorld episode in 1440p. I promised in the last channel update video that I would be playing around with this a bit, and well, it really wasn't all that hard to change all of my recording settings. So here we are, and hopefully this series is going to look a bit more crisp from here on out. Now, near the end of the last episode, we unfortunately had a psychic drone strike the desert, but as you can see right here, that problem is already solving itself, which means we can move on to addressing some of your comments on the last video. There are two things that we quickly want to take care of. One is to put a roof over our camp fuel refinery to avoid short circuits. The other is to separate our two batteries here with a switch so that we can disconnect one of them from the power grid. This has the advantage that if we do get a short circuit somewhere, then only the lower battery will discharge, but we would still have some power in the other one so that our hydroponics farm, for example, could keep running for a while. Now, as you might remember, also in the last episode, Edmo, Troy and Jake all came down with the flu, so Red Hawk's day begins with a round of treatment, while Colony Founder Steak is busy constructing. Also in the comments of the last episode, you pointed out that having a table somewhere in this area might be useful. So that is exactly what we're building here, so that our colonists always have a place to sit down and eat, no matter where they're working. We are also going to beauty up the place a bit with a small statue. Certainly nothing that will turn this workshop into an impressive dining room, but a slight improvement nonetheless. Up next, we're then going to mine some steel, although not as close to the edge of the map as last time. Yes, Red Hawk did barely escape, but I don't wish to repeat that anytime soon. Meanwhile, back in the base, we can see that Troy has actually reached the maximum intellectual level of 20, making him a legendary master, while Steak follows somewhat closely behind, already with a level of 15. And both of their research efforts are paying off in the evening, as we finally unlock the geothermal power technology. This means we can now build a geothermal generator and solve pretty much all of our power needs for the time being, and we are in fact also continuing with a rather research-intensive project, as up next we're going to start working on microelectronics. This is once again one of those bottleneck projects that we definitely have to unlock at some point or another, and at the moment I don't think we have a pressing need anywhere else, and this one is going to keep our researchers occupied for a while. Before everyone goes to bed, however, we can in fact start working on the geothermal generator. With a cost of 340 units of steel and 8 components, it is certainly not cheap, but it's going to output so much power and without going up and down all the time that I think the investment is more than worth it. Now, somewhat unsurprisingly, I think the construction is of course not finished before the end of the night, and on the next morning we first have an event to look at, as we have a group of 20 Mega Scarops wander in. Now, under normal circumstances, I would simply let them pass. They do not give a lot of meat, and it's horribly tasting insect meat at that. However, considering our somewhat dwindling kibble supply, insect meat might actually be something that we could use. So, let us very quickly form a welcoming committee here, and then see how many bugs we can kill before we have to retreat. Alright, somewhat close call there, but I think we killed two or three maybe. As you can imagine though, we do want a bit more than that, so let's use Steak here to lure them around a bit. The rest of the colony meanwhile goes back to work, and yes, this is going to be a somewhat lengthy endeavor. We'll use Steak here to pop out of one door, draw the Mega Scarab's attention over there, and then once things get too close, we'll simply use another door. The big advantage, of course, lies in the fact that our path between those two doors is of course much shorter than that of the bugs, and so with a bit, or rather a lot of patience, we should be able to pick them off slowly and steadily, one after the other. And if you are now wondering why we're not using our turrets to help out, then the answer is quite simple. Our turrets come with a maintenance cost, so after a while they have to be rearmed, and that costs a lot of steel. Not to mention that due to their small size, our enemies are actually not that easy to hit, which means we would be wasting a lot of shots. So overall, the maintenance cost to hit ratio would probably be pretty bad. Now, while all of that is going on, we then receive a quest, and this one could give us another colonist. However, she would arrive closely followed by 12 hostile tribes people, who would of course also have to defeat the bugs first, making the following fight a bit easier, although let's be honest here, they probably would not have too much trouble doing that. 
Ultimately, I did unfortunately decide against taking this quest, simply because half of our colony is still sick with the flu, and also because Anna's description as a space tactician here implies that she is at least incapable of the artistic and social skills, and especially artwork is something that I would like to see on our next colonist, because at the moment Troy is the only one at least somewhat capable of it, but as you saw earlier, his real talents definitely lie elsewhere. So sorry to disappoint you, our colony will not be growing just yet. Whoever does join us next is ideally someone that we can at least check the skills and traits of first, because, well, I do not really plan on falling back into the more barbaric ways of Cambia and company, who would have had no issue sacrificing a less useful colonist. But the steakhouse is being run a bit differently, so we're just going to pretend like we didn't really hear anything and just continue shooting bugs instead. Speaking of which, Steak is certainly getting some good target practice here, even though one sneaky fellow here unfortunately managed to get into the base, and even though this is still far from a fair fight, Steak does sadly suffer a minor injury in the process. To speed up the process a bit and to avoid things like that happening again, he is now joined by Admo and his chain shotgun, and together the two of them then finally manage to kill all Mega Scarabs just as the sun is slowly setting. Stake's injuries then also seem to be nothing too concerning. Just a few seconds after Redhawk applies her treatment, he is already fully healed again, and so the rest of the evening is spent with a bit of insect butchering. Apart from that, though, things remain uneventful. On the following morning, Stake then completes his work on the geothermal generator. All that is left to do at this point is to fence it in to protect it from enemies and to connect it to the power grid, and with that we now have access to plenty of power, arguably much more than we need for the foreseeable future. Edmo, meanwhile, is using the insect meat to make kibble for the dogs. They certainly won't mind the bad taste. Our colonists, on the other hand, most definitely would. And well, that is pretty much all that happens for the rest of the day, until, in the evening, two thrombos wander in. And you know what that means, hunting season is getting an extension, although of course these two are on a whole different level compared to the Mega Scarabs earlier. Still, I do think that we have a fair chance of dealing with them. This time, though, we will need the help of our turrets, which are already activated and waiting as we send out Stake with a bolt-action hunting rifle. That thing should have enough range to hit one of the thrombos and still allow Stake enough room to escape. And there we go, it looks like both animals have now gone into manhunting mode. So let's get Steak into safety and also have him re-equip his heavy SMG, which in the following fight is probably a bit more useful. Jake, meanwhile, is already standing by at the edge of our kill zone. At this point, against two thrombos simultaneously, we definitely need all the firepower we can get. Jake and the turrets alone, however, are not going to cut it, at least not without heavy losses on the turret side. So Steak and Redhawk are coming over to help as well, mostly to draw attention away from those turrets, because losing one or even more of them is something that I would like to avoid. From here on out, the strategy is now pretty simple. Jake and Redhawk will take turns popping in and out of cover. As a result, the thrombos will run back and forth between them, while the turrets and of course the occasional pot shots from our colonists will do the rest. After a short while then, both animals go down, and with that we now have plenty of meat and another hunting session has successfully been completed. On the next morning then, one of the thrombos is getting butchered, which actually results in a slight capacity problem with all the meat. At this point we probably have more meat than hay, but that's okay, we do not have to turn all of it into kibble. After all, our dogs can eat raw meat, even though nutrition-wise that is of course not the most cost-effective option. In the afternoon then, we are informed of a medical emergency, but don't worry, that is only Jake's flu. As you can see though, he will reach immunity before that becomes life-threatening, so there is nothing to worry about. 
Later that day then, while we take care of the fact that Steg accidentally built a roof over the geothermal generator, which now causes severe overheating, we have a trade caravan pay us a visit, and they arrive at our base before bedtime, so let's see what they have for sale. Right, so first things first, we are switching alpacas here, as we're selling our male alpaca Bradley for a female one. Going forward, I think the ability to make some babies definitely makes a bit more sense. We can also purchase a few components, since we're running low and repairs do have to happen from time to time, while we can sell some of the less expensive leathers and furs that we only have in low quantities, but most importantly, we can also sell 147 units of flake. That alone earns us a hefty profit, which can only be increased by selling some old clothing items, including, by the way, a few of those corsets that we had Edmu make a few episodes back, and in the end we are able to almost empty out this trader's entire silver supply. As a result, our faction relations slightly increase and we can now welcome another patron to the colony, and the name that was randomly chosen for our new alpaca here is Silverhand, so congratulations and welcome to the steakhouse. Later that evening then, we have finally made enough kibble so that our freezer can now hold all the remaining meat, although looking at our stables, our supply of hay is likely not going to last that much longer, so it's a good thing we set up that second hay grass growing area. Hopefully that is ready to be harvested before we run into any trouble here. Now that brings us to the next morning, which starts rather unfortunately with a heat wave, which is in all likelihood going to hurt our crops more than our colonists, because thanks to their dusters, they all have temperature resistances up to about 50 degrees Celsius, and while we might very well hit that during the day, it's not going to be enough to cause any health issues. For the next few hours, the day then continues rather uneventful with some drug production and some cooking, Steak and Troy are also busy researching, and so another night sets across the desert, as it is a little hotter than usual, but other than that, things are just the way they always are. And while it is still dark outside, quick sleeper Edmo is already fully rested, and since he is the only capable crafter in our colony, he now has the honorable task of making another flag vest. Except for Jake, all four of our colonists already have one equipped, and while we still also have that suit of armor for Jake, I believe some general protection for his everyday activities is still a good investment. After all, you never know when those drop pots might arrive, and sometimes you simply have to fight as you are. Since that is consuming another component though, Red Hawk begins her day mining some compacted machinery. I believe we have one or maybe two more spots like this on the map. Afterwards, we then have to trade for them or make our own, which does, among other things, require the microelectronics research. So that's one more reason why it was a good idea to start working on that. With all of the components mined out, Red Hawk is then moving over to some more steel, while Jake and Steak are doing some construction work around the generator and are building up another layer of wall. This is just to discourage enemies from mining through here and potentially sabotaging the majority of our power supply, mostly also because that generator was pretty expensive, so all in all, it's an investment well worth protecting. The task is swiftly completed, and with all of the steel coming in, we can now also construct a few new hydroponics basins. As you may have noticed over the course of the episode, we are not necessarily dealing with a food shortage just yet, but we are definitely teetering on the edge when it comes to our supply of simple meals, so a bit more rice is going to make life a little easier, I think. The flag vest is then also quickly finished, and because it is of higher quality, Edmo puts it on himself, and I do believe he has earned that right. Let's make sure, though, that Jake takes the other one as long as he's not wearing his armor. Around midnight then, things once again get interesting, as we have a pack of 22 man-hunting arctic wolves arrive. Not quite sure how they found their way into the desert, to be honest, but now they're here, and we have to deal with them. Or, to be more precise, we can hope that the heat wave is going to do some of the work for us, as arctic wolves are going to suffer a bit as temperatures rise above 40 degrees Celsius, which they will most certainly do during the day. So after building a small fence here so that our animals can still safely enter and exit their stables, we will simply send everyone to bed. Let's see what the night brings and if the heat wave sticks around for a while longer. On the next morning, life inside of the steakhouse continues as usual, and despite the looming danger, we actually have some good news on the animal front, as our donkey Froom has just given birth. 
Now, looking at our supply of animal food, specifically our hay, I think we're running a little low to be able to afford to keep this full, so the plan is to sell it on the next opportunity. However, since we are currently surrounded by wolves, that might take a moment. Still, we are not going to give it a name just to send it away a few days later. I think that would be a bit unfair to the patron who gets selected. Now, since we still have a good amount of steel, we can construct even more hydroponics basins here. If they produce too much, then the rice can of course also be used to feed our animals. And who knows, it might even have to come to that, as we are currently completely cut off from both of our hay grass plantations. And unfortunately, the heat wave also appears to take less of a toll on the wolves than I had hoped. Still, in the late afternoon, early evening, the first signs of heat stroke do start to develop, and well, we can't sit around here locked in by wolves forever, so let's take some action here, the strategy remains fairly similar to what we already employed before. The main issue is, however, that arctic wolves are slightly more resilient compared to mega scarabs, so we usually have to land multiple shots to kill an enemy, and that of course makes thinning out their numbers an even more time-consuming process. And because I don't want our colonists to sit around here all night, we are now going to switch over to a slightly more aggressive approach. We do have a full suit of marine armor after all. And in the last episode, we installed a hand talon on Edmo. And maybe the time has come for him to give that a few practice swings. Just to keep him a little safer, we will also give him a shield belt. And then with Jake and Steak at his back, it is time to slice away. We can use the doorway here as a nice bottleneck to funnel the wolves through behind each other. That way we only have to deal with one at a time. And as you can see here, our three colonists are actually making quick work of their opponents. And yes, Edmo is of course suffering a bit in the process, but mostly scratches and bruises. The armor seems to keep him safe for the most part. And Redhawk is of course standing by, ready to jump in should things get worse. But, believe it or not, after barely more than one hour of carnage, all of the wolves are defeated, at least those in this area of the base. There are still a few more roaming around to the north here, but at the moment, they do not seem to be overly interested in what's going on in our kill zone. So let's take this opportunity to quickly move away those corpses blocking the doorway. We can then also take care of some minor repairs, and most importantly, of course, get Edmo to the hospital and have Redhawk patch him up. Now, as the next morning rolls around, Edmo is of course still recovering, but apart from that, life in the base continues as usual. Some of the wolf corpses are already being burned, a cotton harvest is due, and the heat wave also comes to an end. So life is good, mostly at least, except of course for those few animals still roaming around in the north. Thankfully though, it looks like at least a few of them have already wandered off, while the rest of them offer continued target practice for the dynamic duo of Jake and Steak. And considering the small handful of animals that remain, it doesn't take them long to finish the job. And so another threat has successfully been fended off, our colony is safe again, and one or two of the wolf corpses are actually still usable. To reward us for our bravery, Randy then sends an exotic goods trader our way, and they are certainly lucky they didn't arrive a few hours earlier, otherwise the caravan here may have lost one or two of their members. This way they arrive safely though, and we can see what they have to offer. Okay, so first things first, we can sell our donkey foal here, as well as the two thrombohorns that we obtained earlier. That leaves us with plenty of cash to spare, and we're using some of that to purchase a skill trainer for the artistic skill. I did mention earlier how that is something that we're still missing around the colony, and this right here could help us solve that issue. Now, another intriguing item here is the Arcotag Eye, but we do not nearly have enough money for that, so instead we will settle on the Psychic Harmonizer. Now, this is a very interesting item which projects the user's mood to all of the other colonists around them. In other words, if we install this on someone who is happy most of the time, like Steak for example, then his good mood will boost the mood of all other colonists in the Steak house as well. Things may take a turn for the worse if Steak suddenly gets unhappy though, but as long as Redhog is still alive and the two of them remain together, I do not foresee too much trouble with this. Now, in order to not spend our entire money here in one go, we will also sell the side trainer. If I remember correctly, that was just a quest reward that we do not really have a use for at the moment. 
And that completes our transaction, so Red Hawk can now haul the Psychic Harmonizer back to the base, while Colony found the stake himself will be the one to use the skill trainer. As you can see, he does have a passion for artwork, and with his main skills being in construction and research, he is not the busiest of our colonists, so in the next episode we might have him start working on some artwork. I can only imagine the designs that he is going to come up with. You may fondly remember the things that Troy already made, and I have a feeling that Steak might continue down that exact same path. In any case, I do believe that it's quite fitting to have our colony founder be the one to immortalize important events in the colony, so let's see what he comes up with in the next video. For today, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut, so let's do that, and as always, if you enjoyed the episode, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can either subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.